Jamie. Thank you. I'm going to give you a lecture in two parts. In the first part, I'm going to tell you about the basics of my trade of journalism. In the second part, I'm going to talk about some family histories, the histories of families in this room at the regular Sunday afternoon meeting of, of the resistance. At Topolini's, one of the all too few scenes of the battle against 21st century Australian fascism. This is going to be a long, complicated, and ultimately emotional lecture. What we've come to realise in the resistance, which I prefer as a word to the freedom movement, is that all our institutions and professions are corrupt, gutless, useless, and dangerous. We are on our own. There are still people in the freedom movement, and good luck to them, who are hoping to get somewhere with the legal profession and the courts. If, if there was any integrity in our legal profession, in our courts, I think we would have seen it by now. There are still people who are having a go at politics. We had the best, the best selection of candidates I can remember in any federal election last year in May. Not one of them got anywhere near it. I hope some of them will have the stamina to try again. Personally, I just can't waste any more time on politics. So I've come back to my knitting. I've come back to my trade of journalism. Our group, the resistance, and in particular the new media and our newspaper, The Light Australia, have reluctantly come up to the, to the uh, conclusion that we have to undertake the most difficult job there is, the education of the general public. We desperately need people to wake up. I don't think we will get any shift politically or legally until we have numbers. The COVID project has succeeded. This is the tragedy of our times. It is looking very much like the greatest tragedy of all time. Billions of people worldwide across all age groups breaking every known rule of medical, medical science, virology, vaccine, every, every tenet of common sense, every principle of democratic constitutional government. Billions of people have been injected with a crazy experimental genetic concoction that is quite clearly the most dangerous product in medical history. <laughs> throughout, throughout the Western world, the Western democratic countries, especially the Commonwealth countries of Australia, Canada and New Zealand, People have been subjected to levels of social control which people of my generation, the baby boomers, thought were exclusively the province of the fascist and German regimes of 1930s Europe and more recently of the Soviet Union and Communist China. Indeed, people of my generation grew, we were encouraged to believe that the reason for the Cold War, the justification, if you like, for the Cold War, was to save us from these Orwellian totalitarian governments. And now our governments and corporations are copying them. 
The COVID project could not have succeeded, could not have got to first base without the total, comprehensive, surprisingly well disciplined, brilliantly well organised, crawling, gutless, abject, disgusting prostitution of the mainstream media, the death of journalism in the mainstream, and its replacement by propaganda and censorship. Before I take you into the newsroom, I will just define those words I have used, because words are my tools of trade and I give them specific meaning. When I talk about the mainstream media, I'm talking about the ABC, Channel 7, and the West Australian newspaper. They are the best known outlets for the mainstream in our part of the world. When I talk about prostitution, I want to be quite clear that I mean no disrespect to sex workers who will do hard, honest work, provide a valuable service, and when you think of the risks, the pay isn't all that flash. I would never insult sex workers by comparing them to people like journalists, doctors, politicians, lawyers, judges, chief executives, hospital administrators, university vice chancellors, and all this cast of people, that, that type of person, all these people who have enforced, administered, gone along with this monstrous crime against humanity, the mandating of injections for employment, for study, to even attend, to travel, When I talk about propaganda and censorship, which we still get every day from the mainstream, I'm referring to the work of the political talents that have the greatest influence on today's politicians. I'm referring to Adolf Hitler and Joseph Goebbels. Let's face it, they were brilliant. They pioneered politics as we know it today, as it is practiced today. Thanks. They pioneered the use of radio. They pioneered the use of aircraft. They flew around Germany, tailoring the message to different electorates. They won their most votes in Schleswig-Holstein, where my family comes from on, the, on my grandmother's side. They used the medium of the day, film. The Nazi propaganda films are studied to this day by students of psychology and political science. They did not have television. Thank goodness. Look what today's little Hitlers, shitheads like Mark McGowan and Daniel Andrews have done with the use of the ABC and Channel 7. These are people with no talent and no brains. Imagine if Hitler and Goebbels had enjoyed the use of Channel 2 and Channel 7. They would not have needed the Gestapo. Today's mainstream media are the Gestapo. Take a look if you can bear it at these hard-faced harpies on the ABC, setting themselves up as judge, jury, and executioner behind the microphone. And those hideous Channel 7 newsreaders in people's living rooms every night, spitting out their hate speech, anti-vax. I'm telling a lot of territory here. I don't normally bother with notes. I'll get, I'll get into the swing of this soon. There can be no forgiveness for these criminals. They need to be rounded up. 
But there can be no excuses for the stupidity of the general public in letting these mongrels get away with it. John Filger, an Australian journalist, wrote, these, wrote this in, uh, it was posted on Pearls and Irritations, September last year. In the 1970s, I met one of Hitler's leading propagandists, Lenny Riefenstahl, whose epic films glorified the Nazis. We happened to be staying at the same lodge in Kenya, where she was on a photography assignment, having escaped the fates of other friends of the Fuhrer. She told me that the patriotic messages, that's her words, of her films were dependent not on orders from above, but on what she called the submissive void of the German public. Did that include the liberal, educated bourgeoisie, I asked. Yes, especially them, she replied. Pilger spoke to the playwright Harold Pinter about this expression, the submissive void. This is what Pinter said. The brainwashing is so thorough, we are programmed to swallow a pack of lies. If we don't recognize propaganda, we may accept it as normal and believe it. That is the submissive void. At least, at least the German propaganda films, uh, I wouldn't say they had artistic merit, but they had some artistic interest. The one that annoys me more than any uses the music of Brahms. And every time I hear that piece of music, I see one of these, this Hitler, this Nazi propaganda film of the, of the Hitler youth climbing a mountain. It's just disgusting. But at least they tried. In the propaganda we've been getting every day, they've even economized on the graphic arts. They used a golf ball, a golf ball with a bunch of T's sticking out of it. And this came zooming out of our television sets every hour from the crack of dawn to midnight, as if it had been driven down the fairway by Seve Ballesteros himself. This was the dreaded SARS-CoV-2, the virus. And what we were supposed to do was put on our masks so we're breathing our own snot and making ourselves nick. Lock the house so we don't get any fresh air and exercise. So we make ourselves as sick as possible and hide under our bed, shitting our pants, waiting for Dr. Pfizer to come along, inject us with the poison death shot and put, of it, put us out of our misery. And that's exactly what happened. We were treated like morons, we behaved like morons. I think I'd better take us into the shorthand room. I'm going to take you into the newsroom of the Daily Planet at the time of the mild-mannered reporter Clark Kent and his little mate Lois Lane. The newsroom is chaos, but that's normal. People are shouting from telephones. Some editors are standing over reporters, pointing at the clock as if they don't know the time as the reporter struggles to get that punchy first paragraph, hopefully to interest his readers and the rest of it, and to get his type, to get his fingers moving. The newsroom is a pigsty. Cigarette papers and carbon ground into the floor. But Clark Kent is happy. He has a good story I might lost my pen. Here it is. <laughs> he has a typewriter that works more or less, jumps a few places. And he's got a couple of cigarettes, but Superman doesn't smoke much. It's very hard to light a cigarette when you're traveling faster than a speeding bullet. The first skill to be learned in the life of the Cub newspaper reporter is Pittman shorthand. It's named after Isaac Pittman, who was a genius. It's not much used nowadays for two reasons. It's difficult. It's not an easy thing to learn. 
quite a few people here know Pittman Shorthand. Anne learned Pittman Shorthand when she went to Underwood's Business College. Then she went out and did medical secretarial work. So when we are watching Doc Martin and the good doctor, and these doctors make these amazing uh, diagnoses of weird and wonderful conditions, Anne doesn't just know what they are, she knows how to spell them. The other reason people aren't learning the difficult skill of shorthand, which is described beautifully by Charles Dickens in Don Cox, he had to learn it, is because every word, every burp from every human being, every fart from every cow and every paddock is now recorded on some sort of digital device and it's up there on a the cloud being carefully looked after by the CIA or ASIO or somebody. Personally, I think it's an awful waste of time. But people invent these toys and they think they have to use them. There are a couple of problems with relying on recordings if you're doing interviews in journalism. If you're, if you have, if you're, on, a, if you're on a deadline, it can be a damn nuisance Try, if, you, if there's a word you can't hear. I've had some embarrassing experiences like that. Secondly, as far as I'm aware, it's still illegal to take people's conversations without their permission, unless you're in the government, of course. But most importantly, when you put a recorder, it used to be a tape recorder, it's now some other sort of thing, on the table and say, do you mind if I record this? A lot of people do and they don't speak freely. The first and foremost principle of doing any interview is to get people talking, to get them relaxed to talk. Because when people talk, they tell you stuff. Even stuff they're not supposed to tell you. Now, I learned this skill 55 years ago. I was top of the class, but I might make a mistake or two. But I think I'll just show you enough to give you the principle to understand how Pittman shorthand works. It's a beautiful thing, I love it. This is not the, the good, the good shorthand writers use pencils. In the in the parliament, the shorthand, the Hansard writers have 180 words per minute. They they would come in with uh, and, and work relays. When I was reporting the parliament, recording long, long speeches, I never cease to be amazed by how people can stand up with nothing to say and talk for hours. Yeah, that's right. Not like me. <laughs> I, that, I certainly had 150 words then, but the graduating speed per shorthand is 120 words per minute. I'll just show you how this works. If your, the person who's speaking stops at the end of a sentence, you will have some time to stick in some vowels and punctuation marks which makes it a lot easier to read back. So this, this outline, the M, that's an M. It's a M sound. We'll stick in a, it's above, it's above the line, so that gives a clue. We'll stick in a vowel. My. This outline here, the, the converse of the M is, guess what? N. It's a, so we have a M mm and a M. Mm. It's on the line. So that gives you a clue to the vowel. We'll stick in a vowel here, and heavy dot, my name. This little circle that's supposed to be a circle is a verb, that's it. You've just got to learn that one. There's no rule to it. If it was above the line, it would be has, past tense, or at. 
Now, this, this is supposed to be a heavy downward stroke. That's a j, as in judge. You can be judge. It's on the line. I'll just put in a, a light dot there. I think that's right. The light upward stroke is an R. It's one of the ways to write an R. It's a capital letter, full stop. So that's Jerry. My name is Jerry. The next line, again, we... I better not get tripped up here. The next line is another N, but there's a little circle at the end of the N. That's an S. So, and there's a light dot here, capital letter. That's and. And's one better half. Much better. Now, I'm skipping a few lessons here. This is supposed to be a heavy, a heavy horizontal line, and that's a G. It's a good. This little hook, this little hook here is an R, so you've got a gr. It's a gr. It has a, it's supposed to be just a little end. It's not a very good drawing. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm better with a pencil. But it's halved. I'm just skipping a few lessons here in the short end. It's a group, it's a group with an end on it, and it's halved. So it's grand. It's not, it's not hard when you know how to. This heavy, this is a heavy downward stroke. That's a D, a D. And that vowel is an OR, so it's a door. The little T here has a hook on it and it's heard. So that is door T, granddaughter. Same again. This hard, this heavy downward stroke is a B, a B. The semicircular is an L. Give a vowel here. Bella. Bella. Anne's granddaughter is Bella. Here she is. <laughs> Making a personal appearance. Now, the next line, once again, I've, I've doubled. Uh, I won't, won't explain it now. And there's a little stroke here. That is we are. Two words in one stroke. We call that doubling. We are here. It's a downward R with a little, that gives an H. So it's under the line, so it's here. I won't tell you what it would say if it's above the line, but it sort of might sound solemn. But now, the simple light downward stroke is at. Little verb here. We are here. Now, this is, this is a bit of a challenge. Here's, this is Topolini's. Say you've never heard of Topolini's and you, you've got to, you're there trying to keep up with the speaker and make a shorthand note. So you go back to first principles. I don't think people hear about principles nowadays. They just go to their computers to get the answer. So we have a T, put a vowel here, a P, an L, a couple of N's, and an S. Topolini. With this little hook here is a, a conjunction. You just have to learn that one. And instead, it's pretty scrappy. Well, I'm sorry about the uh, inaccuracy. Of it. This is a P. This heavy stroke in the, is a B with Bella. But with a, with a light stroke, it's a P. It's out of the line. The upward, the upward is an L. Heavy, heavy. Stroke there, capital letter, pillow. We are here at Topolini's with pillow. Now, the learning of Pittman's shorthand in the psychology of learning, which some of you will study, is one of those areas that's known as plateau learning. Another good example of plateau learning, which some of you, Pitt Young Strong Logs, might remember, is a gymnasium. Say you, you've got run down, working too hard, smoking too much, you know, sorry, and you decide you better do something about your fitness, you join a gym, 
you start doing some bench pressing. And you think, this is all right. I might try and get a bit stronger. So say you are bench pressing 140 pounds, and then you uh, decide you like to get stronger. You, you do everything right. You train like a Trojan. You eat lots of peanut butter sandwiches and drink gallons of milk, heaps of protein. You go easy on the booze and smokes. You get to bed early. You speak kindly to your mother. You're nice to small children and dogs. You're as pure as the driven snow. And damn it, you're still doing 140 pounds. Then literally overnight, it all clicks, it all clicks into place. And next time you go to the gym, you're doing 150 pounds. Same with shorthand. Say you've got up to 90 words in a minute. You're getting out, you're getting out here. You, you probably know the theory by that stage. You're learning your short forms. You're practicing, you're going to class. I used to practice by taking notes when I was listening to the news. I can't stand the news now, but it didn't seem to be so bad then. It's good practice. And you're still stuck at, at 90 words a minute. And then, overnight, next time you go to the class, you're up to 110, you're up to 100. So here's the, here's the plateau. At first it's frustrating, learning in plateau. But when you realise what's happening, it becomes exciting. Now at the gym, some people get too excited and they start taking steroids. And if there's one thing we've learned in the last three years, all drugs have side effects. But it, it's understandable, because it is quite an exciting process. I don't think we need to be neurosurgeons to understand what's happening with plateau learning. All this information we are feeding into our bodies, into our muscles, into our fingers, into our brain, is working away, even while we're asleep. The body and the brain are processing this information. And when it's formed into uh, another level, we've jumped up. I became fascinated by Isaac Pittman when, when I started getting competent at Pittman shorthand. Pittman was a genius. He understood the structure of language. Now, I'm sure I'm not the only person here who had an absolute gut full of smart asses in their nerdatoriums in Silicon Valley and the white coated pricks in their laboratories in Wuhan cooking up bad shit in their test tubes, thinking they can improve on this creation, the human body and the human mind. Johann Sebastian Bach was born in 1685, died in 1750 in Leipzig. Okay, Chris, yeah. Thanks for the whiteboard, man. We're just losing our star, Bella. She's off earning, earning her first million dollars making, making bloody hamburgers. <laughs> he died in 1750 in Leipzig. Johann Sebastian was one of 12 children produced by Mr. and Mrs. Bach in what we may safely assume was the conventional manner, without so much as the assistance of an inner spring mansion. There's a chorus in the B minor mass which will inspire human beings for as long as there are people who can sing and read music. All you good Roman Catholics out there will know this chorus. It's the Gradius Agamus TB chorus. Go home and listen to it, turn off the television. If you don't have a recording, there are wonderful performances on YouTube.
gratis egemus tibi propter magnam gloriam tuam. I'll bet some of you know this. Literally, gratis thanks let us give to thee, TB is in the dative, propter the conjunction indicating cause, because on account of magnam gloriam tuam, thy great glory. We thank thee for thy great glory. I did warn you that this is going to be a long. I just wonder if you can indulge me. There's a relationship between music and language, and I'm so, and between music and mathematics. So I'm told. This is from one of the Beethoven biographies. Eric Coe. Beethoven was walking with Ferdinand Ries when he thought of the finale theme for his, for his F minor sonata, Opus 57. That's the Impassionate. Ries wrote, on a walk during which we lost our way so badly that we did not get back to Doberling where Beethoven was staying until 8 in the evening, he mumbled to himself, the mumbling sometimes rising to a shout the whole way. The mumbling rose and fell without any definite notes emerging. When I asked him what was the matter, he said that the theme for the last allegro of the sonata had just occurred to him. And since we came into his room, he went straight over to the piano without even taking off his hat. I sat down in a corner and he immediately forgot about me. He sat fussing over the new beautiful finale of the sonata for at least an hour, finally looked up and was amazed to see me still there. He was still wearing his hat. Who do these people think they are in their laboratories with their computer program? Take a break, eh? Colin? Take a break. Yeah. Take a break. Yeah, I, I won't, won't end up for a while. I'll use the other side next time. Who do they think they are to play around? They really do think they can improve on us, on Beethoven, you've got to be joking, on Shakespeare, by sticking computer chips into it and playing around with our RNA, whatever the hell that is, our DNA. These are ignorant, arrogant, dangerous, savage. The shorthand room was not the only place where cub, rep cub reporters spent most of their time in that first few months. There was an in-house course taught by Jim Dunbar, the cadet counsellor at Newspaper House, who was an ex Fleet Street bloke, very good, terrific course. And one of the speakers I remember was a senior sub-editor on the Western Australian, Betty something, I think. And she said, don't worry about writing your story, just get the facts, throw it together, and uh, the sub-editors will look out for it. Fortunately, we also had a lecture from Bernie Kerwin Ward, who shared the back page of the Daily News with the cartoonist Paul Rigby. It was a, it was a picture in Perth, and, and they were very good, both of them. Bernie, Bernie Cohen Ward had to write a column every day. When I had to write one once a week, it used to drive me crazy. I don't know how he did it every day. But he gave us exactly the opposite advice. He said, use your time. It's all about time on the daily paper. Don't panic. Use every minute of it and write your story. That's your job. Don't just throw it together. Some years later, when I was no longer a uh, cub reporter, but certainly a mild-mannered reporter, Jim Dunbar asked me to lecture the new cadets. Every year the company would take on a dozen or so boys and girls, various ages and stages, to be trained to fill the, fill the ranks of the West Australian, the Daily News. Some of us would do a bit of work for the countrymen, Another weekly was the Sports Review, edited by Doug Gilmore, a very good bloke. I, uh, 
I did some work for them when I was cricket writing. And uh, the class that year, I can remember most of them, but I in particular remember Ray Wilson. Last time I saw Ray, he was looking fit, tanned, playing a lot of golf, enjoying his job as sports editor of the, of the Western Australia. And when I was driving a, my uh, buggy around the paddock in, in the north on a Saturday morning, I used to enjoy listening to Ray and Mark Duffield, I like Mark's footy writing, and Ken Judge on the ABC Morning Sports Talk. Followers of the East Mantle and Hawthorne Football Clubs will have happy memories of Ken Judge in long sleeves, kicking those long, accurate goals from the half forward line. Another cub reporter that year was Paul McGeo. Paul was later in New York for the Sydney Morning Herald. On that date, on that date, the Americans call 9/11. It was it was what we call a big news day. Paul wrote a book called In Baghdad. Uh, he and other correspondents were holed up in a hotel in Baghdad watching George W. Bush's shock and awe bombing. And at one stage they got a bit worried that the bloke, blokes guarding the bombs from the Pentagon or Diego Garcia might accidentally drop one on them. So uh, in which case they would have been, what did they say? Collateral damage. Yeah. Now, in, in this lecture, I gave each of these cub reporters half a dozen photocopies of half a dozen stories I had written in their finished form as they, as they were published in the newspaper and as they, secondly, as they came off my typewriter and I was also able to show them the shorthand notebook, the original shorthand note relating to that particular story, which we were all advised to do to keep our notebooks for legal reasons in case there were arguments about the accuracy of the story. In other words, all the basics of the trade which I had learned and which they were learning in the course that they were attending I had put into practice and they could see the finished result. I had their undivided attention. There were various, various, there are various types of stories, so there are various types of writing. There would have been the uh, sort of on the spot reporting, something happening and, and you're reporting it hasn't happened. And there certainly would have been historical feature and what I call classical reporting where you're reporting a court or a royal commission or something like that. And there would have been a parliamentary story for sure because I spent so much time in the parliamentary gallery. But the toughest story of all was the last one. I saved it to last and I told these cover reporters there are going to be assignments you're not going to like. They will involve interviewing people who've just suffered a tragedy, a bereavement. Nobody likes doing it. And there will be times when they, when you just have to back off, of course, but don't knock it back on principle. And this particular story was a shocker. Two young men, hardly past legal age, were hitchhiking across the Nullarbor Plain heading east. A good Samaritan gave them a lift. Later that evening, they beat him to death, killed him brutally, and stole his car. Obviously, they got caught. And that morning in the Supreme Court, they were sentenced by the judge. And in the afternoon, my chief of staff must have got an address for one of these lads. And he asked me to go out and find out the background. Mid-Friday mid afternoon. So I drove out, it was not a job for a photographer. I drove out to the address, which is in Wembley, I knew the area well. Nobody at home, but there were a lot of birds on this house. Not on, not on all that, just on this house, all over the roof. 
Eventually, the owner came home and it was his father, it was a dad. I told him who I was. He told me to piss off, of course. And I persisted. I, I wasn't, I wasn't rude, but I just hung around a bit. And eventually I found out that those birds were pigeons. His boy, convicted of this brutal killing, raced pigeons. They were his passion. He cared for them with tender, loving, delicate hands. Racing pigeons get injured. Their wings get torn. He sewed up those wings with the same hands that conducted this shocking killing on the Malibor plane. And I went back to the newsroom. I was the only reporter there at that stage. It was getting late on a Friday afternoon. The only other person in the, in the newsroom was our news editor, John Hoffman, who saw me there on my own. Someone said, oh, forget about that, come out of the pub. And I said, no, I want to figure this out. I want to write this story. I had plenty of time. It was for, it's for the next day's paper, the weekend news. And I'm sitting there, how do you figure this out? And finally, the penny dropped. You don't figure it out. You write it. I wrote the story in simple sentences. I can still remember the first two sentences. Pigeons fly over and back to the house of so-and-so in a quiet suburban street in Wembley, full stop. They were an absorbing hobby for his son, whom I named, in the Supreme Court. Next sentence. It's whenever it was on the date, justice so-and-so, and then I ran through the crime and posed the question, the same, those same, those same hands that cared for those pigeons with tender loving care conducted this murder. And then I quoted his dad. As I was telling the story, and as they were reading it, they were on fire, these cub reporters. The questions just flew out of me. We could have stayed there all night. I would have been happy to stay there all night because nothing is more pleasing to a teacher than to have a class of students who are excited about the subject and want to learn more about it. And then Ray Wilson asked this question. I never forgot that. Ray was looking at the text in detail and he asked me, how come you use two words, nonviolent, instead of one word, gentle? What a fantastic question from a cub reporter. I was thrilled a bit since I was Jim Dunbar. The attention to detail and the subtlety, very promising. And of course, I had no idea why I had done that. But I, I had to answer his question. You can't put a, a question of that calibre go and answer. And I looked at the I looked at the sentence and said it was it was probably to do with the rhythm of the sentence. And Jim Dunbar nodded agreement. Nonviolent has four syllables. Nonviolent. Gentle has only two syllables. I'm not suggesting you count all the syllables in your sentences unless you're trying to write the perfect iambic pentameter. But these, this is part of the uh, part of the art, I suppose, the craft. I think I think at its best, journalism is a craft. So you would do this un so unconsciously. Cast a cold eye on life, on death. Horsemen pass by. That's Gates. Look at that second line. Horsemen pass by. Four syllables. You can hear those horses galloping away. 
So the message to young reporters, to all of us, is use your language, know your language, appreciate your language, love your language. Now, have you guys just about had the bomb? Be honest with me. Because I was planning to go into some family history, but it's probably getting away. Can you handle some more? Okay. Tom Offa and his sister Diane normally sit here on my right wing. Tom's overseas or interstate, but Diane's here. Their ancestor, Henry Offer, was a steeplejack at Winchester Cathedral where he was accused of stealing a shovel, an accusation he denied to his dying day, but he was convicted and sent to Western Australia as a convict. He came into the service of Waller Clifton, who was one of the original shareholders in the Peel Estate, and when his time was up, which wasn't long, well, Walter Clifton took him up to the southwest highway and pointed to a stretch of land and said, Henry Offer, that's yours. Henry said, I'm, I'm, I'm not greedy. I'll just take this slice going through to the Benja Swamp. Down the line, one of, one of Henry's descendants married a white man, and that's how the, that's how the first Brick House came to be built at Benja. Talking about Benja with Tom and Diane, we got on to the subject of the Benja School. Benja School is still there as you approach Brunswick Junction on the way to Bunbury. And I said, Anne's mother, Beryl, went to school at Benja. Beryl subsequently married Archer Eckersley of Harvey Archer's dad, Roy Eckersley, was a surveyor who came out from Carlisle in northern England where they know about drainage and he pioneered the Harvey Irrigation District. This is how Beryl Dempster went to school at Benja in her own handwriting. Late in 1928, a school was built at Benja, so we had to travel one way or another. There, the two mile journey, or the, one way, the two mile journey. The horse, and, the horse and sulky or horse and cart were used till we were able to ride bicycles. The poor old horse, Phyllis, had to be content till we returned after school. I doubt if Phyllis minded too much. There's good rainfall down on the southern slopes of the Darling Range. She probably up in her grass. When Don, her young brother, was only four and a half years old, he had an accident on the farm which severed his foot. I remember it well. The nearest hospital was 24 miles away at Bunbury, a long way to travel on some rough, rough rough roads. And by the time we arrived, his heart had stopped beating. But thanks to his wonderful Dr. Flynn, he survived. Here's a picture of Beryl with a brother with his wooden leg standing in front. School pictures never change. Kids never change, thank goodness. Beryl's mother, Anne's grandmother, was Rona Tucky. Anne has Rona's Bible presented to her in 1904 when she was 14 years old. We think probably at the occasion of her First Communion. The 
Kentuckys and the Dempsters were not on the first fleet. They arrived in 1829 and 1830. Andrew Dempster, Anne's great-grandfather, was an early settler of Esperance. And this is the story of how he came to start farming at Northern. In 1888, Andrew Dempster's wife, Emily, became very ill. The nearest doctor was at Northern. In addition, there would be no ships arriving at Esperance for several months. Andrew, fearing for his wife's survival, decided to journey at once to Northern with his eldest daughter, Mary, and two Aboriginals. They traveled in a horse and cart through difficult country for 21 days. It rained constantly during the journey, causing boggy conditions, loss of valuable time, and severe discomfort to Emily. With only a small compass to guide them, Andrew took shortcuts wherever possible. Emily was operated on without anesthesia immediately upon arrival in Northern. Unfortunately, she died soon after. Mary, the eldest daughter, took charge of the young family. Andrew stayed and went on to build a, uh, a homestead, the farm that later became known as Muresk. Many people here will know of Muresk as an agricultural college. Can we go again? Can we go again, Colin? Muresk is named after the Esk River in Scotland. That's right, yeah. Not my back side. What have I done with that pen? Anyone see it? I think it's put in pocket. Here we are. The Swan River. I'm not going easy on you. If the girls need to sneak out for a smoke, the boys need to take a leak and need a strong drink, that's fine. Service here is excellent, the price is reasonable. The Swan River meets the mouth of the Canny River at Point Heathcote. At Point Heathcote, where Captain Sterling was instructed to found the Swan River settlement. Captain Sterling disobeyed orders, rowed his boat further upstream through the narrows and established the new settlement of the Swan River Colony on the present location of our capital city, thereby giving Perth its town planning problems from the very outset. The southern foreshores of the Swan River, going downstream from Point Heathcote, are rather nice. This is not according to scale. There's a headland which used to be the location of the Majestic Hotel. There's a nice bay called Lucky Bay. Goes in here. And that's where our friend Ron and his intrepid mates, when the sea breeze is, is up to gale force, leave the shore on their windsurfers and go screaming across Melbourne water at unreasonable feet. Foreshore goes along here to Point Walter, and there's a long sandbar that goes well into the river. On the northern side of the river, facing Point Walter, is Point Resolution, which is the northeastern entrance to Freshwater Bay. The foreshore along here, near, near Point Resolution, is rocky. Not a good place to be in bare feet. We go past a couple of yacht clubs, the uh, Flying Squadron, Ned Netherlands Yacht Club, Netherlands Jetty, Netherlands Bar. Sweep around here, and there's another long sand bar known as Pelican Point. And this area is one of the quite famous sanctuaries worldwide for birds. Birds come here. They travel between continents. Amazing stories. 
You'll have birds and pelican point to the right down in the Antarctic or north, God, God knows where. And people from all over the world come to look at birds and pelican point. Now, the two major navigation aids in this part of the river are the inner dolphin, here, here, and the outer dolphin, which marks the main channel, and you will see the big boats like the Rottnest ferries rounding the outer dolphin. Going further along uh, downstream, you will come to a spit post, which you'll see on the map. It's called Armstrong Spit. Now, Anne's granddaughter, whom you've met in my shorthand notes, on her school curriculum this year has a river cruise. No kidding. So when she's cruising downstream, she'll be able to point out to her mates and say, that spit post was named after my great-great-great-grandfather. Adam Armstrong established his farm, which he called Dalkeith, after where he came from in Scotland. And just imagine what Perth and the Swan River was like in those days. The river teemed with fish, those beautiful foreshores, the bush, fantastic. You can, you can see some old drawings from those days, give you an idea. But it's still a beautiful city. And if you're lucky enough to have some foreshore or wetlands or virgin bush in your vicinity, don't let anyone get hold of it. Look after it. Guard it with your life. It's precious. My dad, Hugh Rollins, I think this is where I want to be. It has to be anyway. My dad was born in Albany. And his grandfather came out to Australia from Cornwall and settled in this Clare Valley of South Australia. His son, my dad's dad, my grandfather, George, went off to the School of Mines in Ballarat where he studied metallurgy. During the... That's what we do, folks. I think I'll draw about that. Take a break, Mom. You better have a drink, mate. And during the school holidays, as, as kids do, he brought one of his mates back from the, to stay with the family. So his mate fell in love with George's sister, and as these things go in due course, the uh, couple were sent off to Menzies, north of Calgary, where the uh, George's mate, now a mine manager, had the job of establishing a new mining town, a new mine, a new mining town. As the manager, he was given the honour of naming this town, and that's how the West Australian Goldfields town of Kukani got its name. And Auntie Elsie, as a young woman, Aunt Elsie Eckersley, was sent up to Kukani to be a school teacher. And there she met Nigel, whose family had a mine there, and Nigel's right in the store. Their daughter, Jenny, went to Perth Modern School. And if I'd been smart enough to outsmart my dad, I would have gone there too, but my dad was pretty smart. At Perth Modern School, she met up with Sue Voss, and they became lifelong friends. When I joined the Daily News as a cover reporter, it was soon after Jim McCartney, the managing director of WA Newspapers, a, a brilliant newspaper man, had come down to the newsroom and shaken the place up and said, this is now going to be going after young readers, and the two stars of the show are going to be two young women columnists, Sue Voss and Alison Fan, both very good operators. Anne's Auntie Elsie is now 102. 
in Harvey, still on the hind legs. Bronze about him playing travel with Auntie Marge, who's only 95. Throughout his life, from childhood, my dad's best mate was Oz Watson, who grew up on a neighbouring farm in Mount Barker, a farm called North Vale. Oz was the poet of the South West. Diane, this is for you. And your brother. This is The Dear South West by Oz Watson, his most famous poem, beautiful poem. It's autumn in the far southwest, and Lord, I want to go there. The frogs begin to frolic, and the flats begin to fill. The apple trees are fruitful, and the creeks begin to flow there. God, give me back my country, for my heart is with her still. Dull weather in the dear southwest, and Lord, I want to go there. Bright raindrops on the clover now, wet sawdust by the mill. I'm lonely for the carry trees, the giant gums that grow there. Lord, give me back my country and I'll strive to do your will. It's autumn in the far southwest, and Lord, you'll let me go there. I'd stack my fire of jarrah logs. My oldest pipe I'd fill and sit and yarn on stormy nights with trusty friends I know there. God, give me back my country, for my heart is with her still. I'm about to toss a coin to decide how I complete this long, complicated speech to which you have listened attentively, and I thank you. Will I end in my own words, or will I quote, Vance Palmer from 1942. Hmm. I might have lost things. Okay, I'll have to finish in my own words. I never asked my dad why he came back to Australia. I bet everybody here at my age has used those words. I never asked my dad or I never asked my mother. And then, damn it, it was too late. They were not there to answer the question. But we continue these conversations in our sleep, in our dreams, so vividly that when we wake up, there is that desperate, lonely moment when we realise it was a dream and we're here in the real world. I never asked my dad why he came back to Australia. He was never happy here. He never had the same fulfilment that he experienced when he was the shining star on a brilliant faculty in Midwest United States, where the Iowa farmers, prosperous on their small holdings, on their rich topsoil, loved his work, and he didn't have to ask twice if he wanted a scholarship for a promising student. I never asked my dad why he came back to Australia. And now that I Think about it. It occurs to me, if I had asked him, he wouldn't have told me. He would have let me work it out for myself. I think my dad came back to Australia because he wanted his boys, all born in Iowa City, Iowa, and therefore American citizens, to have the opportunity to grow up as Australians. 
Because. 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 Because it is a wonderful thing to be in a struggle. It is a privilege to be in a struggle. 